Greetings, friend. It's a joy and a privilege to be able to come to you again this month. I um, am now seated right here in my office, just making the introduction to this tape. This tape this month will be a message that was brought uh, at the Arbor Baptist Church in Pell City, Alabama, a message that uh, you possibly have heard me preach before. I'm not real sure about that as I uh, talk to you because I'm not real sure how extensively you have listened to me. But this is a message that I felt must be sent out. I felt that uh, somehow, some way, God impressed me that this message must be sent out. So I trust that it will really uh, mean something to you. I am not sure why the Lord wanted this sent out. I know that it ministered to the people greatly that heard it there that night in Pale City. And many, many people responded to the uh, decision time at uh, this meeting when this message was preached. Well, I praise the Lord for the opportunity to come and share with you from time to time. I don't know what the message last month meant to you, but a great number of people have responded by calling or writing and telling me what the message last month really meant to them. I trust that it meant a lot to you, possibly unless you were somewhat passive and and not been caught up in the grip of passivity. The message did not mean as much to you, but nevertheless, it did mean a great deal to so many people. It certainly met a need in my own life, and and I trust that uh, if it did not mean much to you as you listen to it last, that one day when you have need of it, you'll have the tape around, and that it will mean a great deal to you then. I promised you last month that I was going to talk to you about the building here in Euless. I have really believed God that God will raise up a building for evangelists to be housed in where we can uh, go out and come in and make use of the facilities on a very economic basis as well as make use of the equipment in the facility. And uh, this is all so beautiful. And the interest for such a building is more exciting right now uh, than it's ever been. But we have hit a snag. You uh, may recall, you may not recall, I'm not sure about that, but back when I first uh, got the vision of the building, it was to build a building and allow evangelists to buy their portion as an investment where when they retired or when they passed away, they would have a nice sum to retire on or to give their remaining family. And this was the vision I really had. Well, along came a friend who definitely had some money committed to the Lord, and he felt that this was what the Lord wanted. Well, in the meantime, another friend of that friend, who both being a friend of mine, are friends of mine, felt that this is what we should do. So somehow, some way, we began to work on getting the building uh, with the money on hand, God supernaturally, it seemed, put the money available uh, to do this work. But with this money, it was cutting out the real objective that I, or one of the objectives that I had at first. Well, anyway, these friends have come to the conclusion that God is uh, not leading in this direction. So uh, naturally, uh, the money has with, uh, situation has been uh, not withdrawn, but put on hold. And one of the friends uh, is moving from this area back to Oklahoma City. But this does not change the fact that we're going to build a building. In fact, it looks nearer now than ever. And I want you to keep on praying that God will raise up this building. I feel like that this building is turning into one of the real issues in my life. And the devil said, I'm going to make a fool out of you. 
And the Lord seemingly indicates, listen, you just keep on believing. I'm going to see you through, and I'm going to deliver you, and I'm going to bring you in. So you may just want to sit by and watch the battle, or you may want to get in the battle with me by prayer and really seek the face of God. And it may be that some of you that's listening to this tape are supposed to have some part in it. And I'm not real sure what that part is, but uh, nevertheless, I believe God will show you. But anyway, that's where the building situation is. I want you to pray earnestly for me. I do not know when God has blessed my life so as he's blessing it right now. And my heart is so excited. And my physical being is so much better than it's been in, in years. And so I want you to pray that God will just keep on blessing in my own personal life. And I wish you'd pray for my family, that my family could uh, find the perfect will of God in every way. They are being uh, grown by the Spirit of the living God. And it's a real experience for me to sit by and watch my family grow in grace. And I just praise God for the opportunity. And uh, you pray for them. It's such a joy to be able to do this. In fact, I think I'm learning more about what to teach people on how to grow in grace from watching my family grow in grace than any other group uh, that I've ever watched grow. So uh, pray for me. Pray. You, uh, Many of you have been praying for Marthy. Uh, she recently got the cast off her leg, and she's uh, hobbling around, but she's doing good. And next week she's supposed to go to... Uh, uh, back to Houston and start taking therapy in order to be able to use her leg. And I understand from the doctors that uh, she should walk without a limp or anything and that she uh, will just get along real well. Well, anyway, thank you for praying. Praise God for your faithfulness, you standing with us financially, prayerfully, and uh, I love you in the Lord. And thank you for being so kind and patient and understanding. And I trust that some way, somehow, we're ministering to you just a little, your friend in Christ. Listen to this message prayerfully, that God will speak to your heart, change you forever. I'm about this matter of knowing that you know that you know. And uh, when you know, you know. You know, you know. And it's a mystical knowing. And theologians will never be able to explain it. But the man who has it know it. And I trust that God is giving you a good time this week. All of these fellows are saying all these precious things about what the Lord is doing for them this week. I just, I've been having to pray that I wouldn't get excited. Because if when I get excited, I can't sleep for about two days. So I've been holding on and just uh, praying. And old brother Jimmy, he gets this bunch singing tonight, and he's going to stir me up in spite of everything. <laughs> but uh, I just, uh, I, that's, uh, I used to slip off to North Carolina just occasionally so I wouldn't backslide. You know, let's listen to those. Uh, mountain folks sing. And do something for you, Brother Bill. And do something for you. I praise God for His goodness tonight. I thank God for what He's going to do in this meeting before it's over. There are many things you have to learn about God if you're going to walk with Him. If you're going to really walk with God, just a lot of things you got to learn. And um, to learn the things that it takes to walk with God means more than just coming to some little intellectual concept of understanding. It means that you've come to a vital understanding that this is God's way. And God has His ways. He has his acts, but he has his ways. Amen. And you have to learn his ways. The children of Israel knew his acts, but Moses knew his ways. Amen. And I trust tonight that 
God is teaching you His ways. It's uh, it's always a thrill to me to be able to be at the right place at the right time. That's a that's a thrilling experience. It's always a unique blessing to have it confirmed, you know, by just the sovereign grace of God that you're at the right place at the right time. And it's always beautiful for God to just come in on your life and and just uh, say something special to you while you're at the right place at the right time and let you know that he's up to some things. And I believe tonight that God is doing the work in this church. Not just tonight. I believe he's been doing the work. I believe he's been doing the work in Jimmy's life and in his uh, family. I believe he's doing the work in the family of this church. And I believe that... uh, I believe Christianity is looking at its greatest days. I believe that we're going to have a Pentecost that will out-Pentecost Pentecost. I think that we're headed in some times when what preachers that really walk with God uh, have experienced and teach, I believe that the world is going to listen. And... And you can't uh, sit and watch the news or read the newspapers without getting terribly disturbed, can you? And you have to go back to the Word of God to have some real peace. And I believe that there are going to come disturbing times. And I tell you, I believe they're up on us. They're really up on us where the men and women who preach and live the Word of God are going to be listened to. About uh, almost 20 years ago now, almost 20 years, maybe about 17, 18 years ago, the Lord uh, began to deal with my heart about learning how to trust Him. And I began to ask God why did He want me to learn this truth other than just for my own personal benefit. And God began to show me that there were there was coming a day in this country when the men who knew how to walk by faith, men who knew how to walk with God, would be able to feed spiritually and materially the people who did not know how to walk with God. And the people would flock to their doorstep. And I believe that God is teaching this church some truths that will minister to thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And I believe this week that you are uh, on some of on the on the, in the light of some of you some of you and your life. I believe you're at the crossroads. Now, there are some people that's made decisions to go on. But let me tell you something. God is not going to hurt you. <clears throat> the most painful things that I have ever been through tonight, I can honestly say they were the most blessed of my life. God is not going to hurt you. And you can go all the way with God. Friend, you can stake it all on God. There's a lot of things you'll have to learn, which I've already said. And I'm coming back to something that you're going to have to learn. You must learn. The Bible says, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. If a, sin, if a church covers sin, it shall not prosper. Right. But if an individual covers sin, that individual shall not prosper. So the thing that you're going to have to learn is how to live in a right relationship with God and a right relationship with your fellow man. Now you can say you're right with God this way, but you're not right with man this way, and it's not real. 
Because when you're right with God this way, you are right with your fellow man this way. Now, most of us have a tendency to be deceived by the deceitfulness of sin. Which means the deceitfulness of sin means that, uh, that we have sin in our lives and we think we're right with God. So we have to cry out to, to the Lord to have mercy on us and judge us. Lest God has to let us fall on the rock and be crushed. If we fall on the rock ourselves and let God judge us, then God doesn't have to judge us in the sense of his judgment falling upon us. And what I'm saying is this tonight. The Lord wants us to look at ourselves, not in introspection. Do you know what introspection is? That means you go hunting and looking for sin in your own life. But he wants you to expose yourself to God. As Psalms 139 says, try me and prove me and see if there be any wicked way in me. God wants you and me to do this. God wants you and me to let our hearts be exposed to him and to our fellow man so we can be clean before God and clean before man. Because God wants to have a clean, pure river flowing through our lives. Jimmy said something tonight when he said that that time of confession opened up a river that's never quit flowing. And I thought about that in my own heart and life. And I realized immediately that that's one of the basic, that's one of the basic truths a man and a woman, a boy and a girl must learn if they're going to walk with God. And that's how to keep a clear heart before them and God and their fellow man. They must learn that lesson. Now, in, Psalm, in, um, in Romans 6, 16, we have a verse that the Lord has dealt with me on for a number of years. It says, Know ye not to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey? His servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Now here in this verse of scripture, the Lord says there's two roads for a child of God to travel. There are two roads for a child of God to travel. One road is the road unto righteousness. And the other road is the sin unto death. There's just two roads. Everyone in this building tonight, listening to me talk, you're either on the road of obedience unto righteousness, or you are on the road to the sin unto death. That doesn't mean God's going to let you die tomorrow. But it does mean that you're on a road of disobedience to God, and it's going to lead to your death. And it's all determined by whom you yield yourself to. Now, you can only yield yourself to the Lord. And when you refuse to yield to the Lord, you automatically yield to the devil. That's true. Now, I could technically say this tonight and be technically so. You are either full of Jesus tonight or you are full of the devil. Now, that sounds awful and it sounds ugly. But sometimes I think we need to be blunt in order to wake, wake people up. But uh, you're either obedient to the Lord tonight or you are obedient to the devil. Now, what I mean by that is you're obedient to the Lord and you're on the road of righteousness are you obedient to the devil and you are being, you're on the road of uh, the sin unto death. And the tragedy of this is, you may not know that you're on the ladder. You may think you're all right. I may even think I'm all right. In fact, most of the time I think I am all right. And I trust that I'm being honest enough with you that you'll let God really speak to your heart. I'll not isolate you. Let's just look at this word. word. Know ye not 
that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey. Now watch this. It says, his servants you are to whom you obey. In other words, it says you can tell who you're obeying by the one you're obeying. In other words, you're obeying the one that you are yielding to. Boy, that's a tough verse. I mean, it's tough. Yes. And the tragedy of it is, you can be saved by the grace of God and really saved and love Jesus in the sense that we say we love Jesus and yet be obedient to Satan. And be on the road to the sin unto death. If you're not sensitive, in for instance, my cup runneth over. When your cup is not bubbling and running over, it's been it's because you have been disobedient to the Lord. And you're on the wrong road. Now he, in the 17th verse, he gives us the, the key to all of this. And I, I won't read that verse and then move on. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from that heart, from the heart, that form of doctrine which was delivered you. What was he talking about here? You have obeyed from the heart the truth that was delivered you, the doctrine that was delivered you. What is he talking about? Let, watch me just illustrate this. It's so simple. I apologize for it, but it's helped so many people. I believe it will help you tonight. Here is a person that's lost and dead in trespasses and sin. Here's a person that is not saved, and therefore they, they need to be saved by the grace of God. And somehow, some way, the Holy Spirit of God confronts this lost person that they are lost and that Jesus is the Savior. Now, when a lost person is confronted with the fact that they are a sinner, and that Jesus is a Savior, they must make a decision as to what they will do with Jesus. Now, when this lost person, seeing themselves lost, and seeing that Jesus Christ is the remedy for their sin, that Jesus has already paid the price for their sin, they must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, friends, when they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that is what you call obeying from the heart. They believe from the heart. They obey from the heart. They obey from the heart that doctrine that's been delivered. They, when they obey, they do not half obey. They completely obey with the light that they have. They obey to the measure of light they have. And the measure of light they have, when they obey from the heart, God makes their spirit a new spirit. And his spirit and that man that gets saved, spirit becomes one spirit. And as long as that person is obedient to the light that God has given them, the Holy Spirit has access to that human spirit to flow through that soul and flow through that body and flow into that person's environment and reproduce the life of Jesus Christ. Because that person has obeyed from the heart. And, beloved, when that person obeys from the heart, not only is the Holy Spirit able to do a work of regeneration in the life of a lost person, but the Holy Spirit then has access to flood the spirit and flood the soul and flood the body and flood the person's environment. Now, let's watch this person grow in grace. Let's just watch him grow in grace for a little bit. The average church member never takes over two steps of grace in their whole life. Never take over two steps of grace. They get saved, and they get usually victory over stealing the tithe. And that's about all they ever get. Now you say, well, Brother Manley, what about all this Bible knowledge? If it's not converted into character, it's not growth in grace. You see, half of your church members never even get victory over smoking or dipping or chewing. Amen. <laughs> 
He said, well, Brother Mantle, I never had that problem. Well, thank the Lord you didn't have to get victory over it. Be careful, Brother Jimmy. I'm not. I, I, I determined earlier this week, son, if I preach on gluttony, this whole bunch will be on the. I'll, uh, I think I'll probably touch on that before it's over, but. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, but here's the typical way an average Christian grows. After they get saved, about the next thing that comes along in a Baptist church is a man finds out he's supposed to be tithing. Sometimes he looks at it on the negative point. He's a thief. Not tithing makes you a thief. But some way, somehow, the Holy Spirit comes to this person after he's been saved. And uh, usually it's through the preaching of the gospel, the teaching of the gospel. But here is a man... He sees himself a person that is not tithing, and he's a thief. The devil's sitting right there by him while he's uh, listening to this message. The preacher may be teach- preaching, or the teacher may be teaching, and he says, listen, God teaches that you're supposed to give uh, 100%, not 10%. Yeah, 10 sinners, brother, are still under the law. Grace is 100%. Amen. It's not less than 10, but it's 10 and more. Right. Amen. 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 Yeah, grace will always fulfill the law. Yeah, I like that. But friend, it won't to stop at the law. Amen. It's all of it, says Lord. And as Lord, it's not how much I give, it's how much I keep. But anyway, we'll just keep our ten sinners. And we, 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 because that's about all the light that the average Baptist gets. Is you just supposed to give ten percent. So, okay, here we go. Supposed to give ten percent. He gets this light. God is so gracious that he'll even use fragmented light to keep us fragmented truth so we can be fragmented Christians and not as sorry as we were. <laughs> Amen. That's the same way. And I've been riding the same boat you're in, so don't get upset with me, because I'll assure you, if you sit around, I'll help you. Uh <clears throat> Here this person realizes that it's, it's he or she is supposed to be giving. The devil sitting right there as the preacher or teacher says, Listen, if you give 10% to God, I guarantee you God will take it, shake it together, press it down, turn around and cause men to give back to you, and I'll tell you what, you can get by further on 90% than you can 100%. And you know that's the truth, scripturally. But mathematically, it's a lie. <laughs> Logically, it's a lie. But the devil said, and sitting there and said, listen, that stupid teacher, that stupid preacher, anybody's got sense. God gave a bill ago, no good and well, you can't get by better on 90% than you can 100%. The devil will sit there and argue with you about that. And you can't figure out, you can't figure out how in the world you can get by better on 90% than you can 100%. Yep. But neither could you figure out how God could forgive you of your sins and save you by His grace yep. when you just said, Lord, live or die, sink or swim, I'm coming home. And you got saved. The moment you obeyed from the heart that truth that was delivered you, you got saved. Amen. And so, boy, just like you got saved, here you come running to Jesus about this business of tithing and said, God, I can't figure it out. I don't understand it. Sink or swim, live or die. I'm going to trust you with this thing. Just like you got saved, you trust Jesus about this time. <clears throat> Unless you're legalistic. And if you're legalistic, you just try to go ahead and do it without coming by the cross yeah. and coming by the grace. Yeah. Yeah. And what you do then is you just have to tithe because you're obligated. <laughs> and if you have to make yourself tithe, brother, you have missed the cross and the grace. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So here, here you come. 
You've taken two steps of grace now. Amen? Now, but remember, the basis of your grace is light. You've got two phases of light. You've seen the light about your salvation. You've seen the light about your finances. That's all the light you've received. And to the light you've received, you've been obedient from the heart. And as you have been obedient from the heart, you have kept your heart open to God. You have made it possible not only for the Spirit of God to fill you, but flood, just literally overflow your life and reproduce the character of Jesus in you. Even though you're just a little babe. Boy, it's sweet. Let's go one more step. This is taken by a number of people in the church. But not a lot. Preachers up preaching and somehow, some way, people get two people in the church get convicted that they've got habits that's sinful. And I'll tell you, you'd have to go a long way to hear a sermon against habits today. But uh, here are these two men. Let's just take two men. They are convicted. Now, regardless of what you think about it, this is an illustration. I always like the way these illustrations fit, you know, but this is an illustration. These two men are convicted that their habit is sinful and they're sinning against God. That they are abusing the temple of God. They're tearing it down. And boy, there's a lot to be said about this. So what are they going to do? One of them says, well, this habit, God didn't give it to me, and what I need to do is I need to try my best to quit it. And I'm afraid if I go down there and put my cigarettes on the altar, I might go back to them and I will I will belittle God's tes- testimony and I'll let God down and all this stuff, and he's really concerned about God. What he's really concerned about is himself, but uh, uh, God can handle his end of the testimony. Don't you worry about God. But uh, he says, so what he decides to do, I'm going to quit, and I'm going to take these things home, and I'm just going to put them on a shelf over there and, and just not say anything to anybody, not even my wife. And boy, he makes a decision to try his best to quit his cigarettes. Let's just follow him on through. He goes out and gets in the car the next morning with a bunch of men headed to work and they're smoking. And he's got him a Bible in his pocket. So when he reaches for that cigarette, he'll hit that Bible. And it'll remind him, oh, Lord, I quit smoking. And man, he wants a cigarette so bad he cannot stand it. Now this man's got real willpower. And I mean he's determined, and I want you to know, friends, he buys him a carton of gum, not a package, a carton of gum. He chews that gum. He hits that pocket. I mean, he does everything he knows he can do, and he just stays off of them, and he starts getting fat and fatter and fatter and fatter. And boy, I mean, he, but he stays quick. And if he's really got determination, he may even quit it. But he still wants one. Now, I want you to know that's religion. That's not Christianity. Now, that person, now I know good and well that, that people have battles with these things. Amen. And it's not to, uh, and I'm not being ugly about it. I, I believe I've got mercy on the person that's battling with issues like this. So here comes this other fellow. He says, God didn't give me these things, and I can't handle them. And I like them, and I know it's wrong. I've seen tonight it's wrong, and I detest myself for you. And God, I'll tell you what, I can't handle this problem. Sink, swim, live, or die, I'm coming to you, and I'll smoke enough before I get out of the church if you don't do a work of Christ. So he obeys from the heart that truth that's been delivered. He's come to the cross, and he's come to the grace. And he falls at the mercy of Jesus, just like he got saved. Colossians 2, 6 says, As you receive Jesus Christ, your Lord, so walk you in him. 
Just like you got saved by grace through faith. Just keep walking on the same principle. Just the same way. And boy, you know what? He goes outside that church, goes home, gets out and gets in the car with a bunch of men smoking the next morning, and I've got news for you. He does not even want a cigarette. Now the devil kicks him, but the temptation is from outside, not inside. Amen. Now that's victory. Amen. Now the devil tempts him, but it's not it's not the nature of lust coming out of him now. Now this man, the last man we talked about, has taken three steps of grace, and as far as the light that he's received, you know what? He is full of Jesus. Now the man that tried to quit smoking himself did not dislike Jesus. He did not even dislove Jesus. He did not turn his he did not reject Jesus as just rejected. He decided he was going to try his best and he pursued Jesus. And got to operating on the energy of the flesh. Now that man shut the door where the Spirit of God could no longer work through his spirit into his soul and into his body and into his environment. And you know what happens? That man now releases the flesh. And the flesh of the world or even Satan. Either way, it's just the devil is in charge of his life. And you know how long the devil is in charge of his life? Till he comes right back to the point he rejected. Or or not rejected, where he refused to let Jesus have it. And if he goes down the road 30 years, he'll never grow anymore in grace. He'll grow in knowledge. He'll know there's... 66 books in the Bible. He'll know this and that and the other. He'll know all this about God. But he will not know God. And you can tell because the moment he the moment he refuses to let Jesus have his problem, that moment, that man starts by obeying the flesh. He starts on the road to the sin unto death. Right. That moment. Right. The other man has been obedient unto righteousness. His obedience is led to righteousness. The other man's disobedience is led unto death. You always tell whether or not the flesh is in charge of your life by whether or not you sin and wish you hadn't. Where, where Satan picks, where Satan works more of God's children than any other place is in the area of an uncontrollable temper. Our resentment, sins of the, sins of what we call sins of the spirit. And tonight you can tell whether or not you yielded to the Lord or to Satan. Now here's the strategy of Satan. Here's the strategy of Satan. Satan does not care how many of us give God, let's say, 39 acres of our lives as long as he can get one. You remember this illustration I gave you? I gave it to you. Everywhere I go, I'll tell it. And you'll remember when I started. If I own 40 acres of land, and I sold your pastor 39 acres of land, and I kept one acre, and he agreed that one acre is mine, he could build him a 39-acre home on that 39 acres and leave my one acre as a patio area. I could come back a few weeks later. I could come back a few weeks later and say, listen, I'd like some dirt off of that one acre. And he couldn't stop me. He'd have to give me a right-of-way to my property. And I'll tell you what, my dear friends, I could get that right-of-way to his property. I could belittle him, disturb him, confuse him. Baffle him. I could do everything else. I could do almost anything in this world 
And the longer I could deceive him as to what I was doing and what was going on, the longer I could stay there and confuse him. That's right. And I tell you, I could literally defeat his life. And I mean control his life from that one acre. Now, you listen to me carefully. The devil does not care how many of us in this building tonight give God 39 acres of religious work. Come on. Because as long as there is one thing in our life that's not yielded to Jesus, that means if you know one thing in your life that's not yielded to Jesus tonight, you're yielded to the devil. Yeah. Yeah. He's got it all. But he'll let you yield 39 acres of religious works to God. He'll let you sing. He'll let you tithe. He'll let you witness. He'll let you read the Bible. He'll let you do all of this junk. That's called religious work, and everybody in the church will think you're the best member in the church because you do everything everybody expects you to do. But my dear friends, when you get home, you lose your temper at your wife, you lose your temper at your husband, you lose your temper at your children, you lose your temper at your, uh, your children lose your temper at you, you curse, you lie, you steal, just one little old thing, but you act like the pure D devil. When the, when the button is pushed, you act like the devil, and the devil has control over everything. Because, see, he's either Jesus is Lord of all of you, according to the light God has given you, or he's not Lord at all. Amen. And what the devil will do, he'll hide his identity and let you have 39 acres of religious works where everybody in the world will think that you are hot stuff. And then when he gets ready to use you, you know what he'll do? He's got that one anchor in there, so he just slips in and causes you to act like the devil right in front of your friends. Embarrass you, abuse you, belittle you, just literally, literally destroy you. I know of a woman back in Texas that criticized her pastor. Now, her pastor did a wicked thing, but she had no business doing what she did. She criticized him. And rather than get right with Jesus about it, she moved her letter. And she came to this church, and she and her husband were very wealthy people. And they were very strong leaders, so they started pouring several hundred dollars a week into this little church and started teaching. It wasn't long until he was Sunday school superintendent and a deacon in that church, and she was the latest ladies' teacher. And boy, they were they were leaders, and rightly so. They were educated people, you know. They've been in leadership. They were leaders, and uh, and I remember that pastor just kept preaching the cross. Jesus is either Lord of all or He's not Lord at all. He's Lord of all and He's not Lord at all. And one day, you know what happened? This very culture woman got up and cursed right in the church. And when she did it, she was so embarrassed, but it was too late. It was out. And they said, oh, my, she got full of the devil today. No, she got full of the devil back then. When she criticized that preacher and didn't give out of God. And she was full of the devil all that time. But the devil let her have 39 acres of religious work, see and then when he wanted to use her, he used her and tore that church all to pieces. Right. You see, Jesus is either Lord of all of your life tonight or he's not Lord at all. He is either Lord of all of your life tonight or he's not Lord at all. I used to have a little trouble with... Uh, statement Vance Haverman made. Jesus, you know, he talks a little through his nose. He says, Jesus is either Lord of all or he, he's not Lord at all. Oh, Lord. I just devastate me. And then I ran across the scripture says something about sweet and bitter water can't come out the same fire. Have you ever wondered about that? Sweet and bitter water cannot come out the same fire. That really shook me. Because I'd look at my own personal life. 
And I'd see one day sweet water coming out. And the next time I'd see bitter coming out. And I couldn't understand what was going on because it looked like sweet and bitter water was coming out of the same fountain. But this is what I discovered. As long as I was properly related to Jesus by obedience, I was related to him by obedience, there was sweet water coming out. And when the bitter started coming out, somewhere back there, I had changed fountains and started walking in the flesh. Yes. If I had a lemon tonight and gave it to you to squeeze, what do you think you'd get out of it? The, uh, the absolute answer, the answer that is an absolute is what's in it. And tonight God allows us to be placed in predicaments and squeezed so we'll see what's in us. And what's in us come out. And I've got news for you. If you're obedient to the light that God has given you, Jesus is going to come out. But if you've been disobedient to the light, Jesus is not coming out. You'll act like the devil. Now, in order to get right with Jesus, you know what you have to do? You have to confess your sins up to date. You have to go back to that point of controversy. You have to ask God, Lord, where have I been disobedient to? And get right with Jesus. You have to get your obedience up to date. And most of our obedience is so far behind us, we miss God so far back under that we'll we'll have to ask God to, to bring us to the light and show us where we miss God and get right with Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me, please? If God has dealt with your heart tonight and you can't handle it, I want you to know Jesus can. And at the cross, He can handle it. And your honesty is at stake. And you want to do something about it. All I can do is invite you to the cross. Where you first saw the light. Just like you got saved. Just like you got saved. You can get victory. Just like you got saved. Know you not to whom you yield yourself servants to obey. His servants you are to whom you obey. Would you settle it with Jesus tonight? No further invitation than just right what we're doing right now. No music. God has dealt with your heart. You come to Jesus. You, you have to get to Jesus yourself. I can't get there for you. You know whether or not God's dealt with your heart. So you let him have his way with you.